All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's edition of Learning Space with CosmoQuest. Uh, my name is Nicole Gallucci. I am the postdoc uh, with the CosmoQuest project. And over in the other screen, we have our guests with Georgia. Do you want to introduce everyone? Hi, um, I'm Georgia Bracey. I'm going to be peeking in and out of the screen um, today because I'm sharing my office with two wonderful people. Today we have on the show Jeff and Terry Menz. Um, they are astronomers uh, that do, ast well, amateur astronomers that do all kinds of wonderful outreach and education um, during their star parties and other events, and we'll be talking all about that with them today. Yeah, and I want to uh, remind everyone, if you want to comment or ask questions, you can do so on the YouTube page where this is streaming. You can do so on the Google Plus event or anywhere else on Google Plus that this is playing. We'll be watching those. And if you're watching somewhere else and want to comment on Twitter, use the hashtag Learning Space, and we will uh, we can monitor those as well. Okay, so do we have a demo to start with? Do you guys want to start with that? You, I think we do. So um, this is going to also involve me tipping my monitor over just a little bit, but we've done that before, and it should still work again. So, um, but let me start out with Terry. Do you want to um, explain just a little bit about what you're going to show us, and then we'll go ahead and take a look. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Terry Menz, and I am the Outreach Coordinator for Riverbend Astronomy Club. I'm also an educator in a local high school, I went to a high school, um, and we get these kits from um, the Night Sky Network. It's a, a consortium of different agencies that have come together to provide educational materials like this, and so I utilize these in our outreach, and I have a lot of volunteers that help me do that. This particular kit talks about how to tell an earth rock from a space rock, which is kind of a hot topic right now with the recent um, interest in meteors and meteorites. Um, so this one has, has, has especially been, been popular with kids. So with the way that these kits work, they, they're very, very user-friendly um, and help us to, tell, to show the public just what we um, are trying to convey um, in a in simpler terms. So what the um, the the uh, Night Sky Network provides to us is basically a script. So this little um, note card uh, booklet that I have has two sides. It has a side that I show the public, and it has a side that tells me what I could say. Um, and most of the time, what we do, um, the astronomers in the in the Night Sky Network do is go through it a few times with the script and then we just make it our own. We, we take ownership of it and do it our own way. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we talk about, um, the first more step that we talk about when we're looking for a, a different um, a, a space rock and, or deciding if it's a space rock is we look at how light it is or how dense it is not or if it has a lot of air holes in it. And for instance, this take, rock. See if we can take a look. Oh, we have demo. Yes, we have demo. So this rock has a lot of air holes in it, and if, if someone that's well versed in rocks would recognize this as as a lava rock, or as a cinder, a cinder, like a cinder type of a rock. Yeah. And so this one would um, not likely, you know, if they, they you might put that one in the category that says I think these are earth rocks. We take it out of the category that says not sure about these rocks and put it in, I think these are earth rocks. Um, and we go through some other criteria. We might say that um, earth rocks um, tend to be, um, they can be on the lighter side, whereas rocks that have come through the atmosphere have had a lot of um, incineration going on. As they come through the atmosphere, they get very hot. And so if it's got a light color, it's probably not going to be an earth rock. Um, not, the, a space rock. Not, not, uh, not, not a space rock. That's correct. <laughs> Good job. Sometimes I talk too fast when I do these, and the kids correct me. So um, this is one that would, would, would end up falling into that, that category also. It's a little bit on the lighter side. This rock um, is on the lighter side, too. It's hard. If we talk about density and how heavy it feels for its size, and this one is not very dense, and so this one would also be um, more likely an earth rock. So then we get down to just a few rocks and then we start to think about it in terms of some other properties and when when rocks come through our atmosphere they have a tendency to burn off some of the 
material that's that's in them. And the material that's less likely to burn off are the the iron um, parts of that rock. Um, there might be some other metals or some other compounds still in it, but for the most part, the iron is going to be left. Plus the fact that when we find a meteorite on the surface of the Earth, chances are that it has undergone some erosion from wind and rain and um, just um, the effects of freeze thaws. So you're more likely to find a rock that contains metal that would be the remnants of a meteorite. So most of the other ones have eroded away and so that we don't have those available to, see, to find. But what the next test that I, the kids just love this part, is <laughs> using a magnet. And so we'll test them for how magnetic they are. And some Ooh, are very yeah, magnetic. That's cool. And so we'll say, <laughs> oh, I think this might be a meteorite. <sighs> and we just wave it over the other ones and then, oh, that was pretty metallic. So we'll put that one. I think Yay. this might be a meteorite. And then there's a few that are a little bit stubborn. But if we put them on a smooth surface, oh, cool. put the magnet next yeah. to it, it does have some magnetic properties to it. So yeah, that could be a meteorite. Now let's see, this one doesn't look much different than that one. Does it? Is it magnetic? Nope, it's not magnetic. <laughs> so we'll put that in the earth rock. Okay. Now, when we get down to it, now we have to start talking about some of the other tests that we can't do at that particular session. And if we did more tests, we'd find out that this particular rock is, is an earth rock, and it's called a lodestone. And it is naturally magnetic, but it did not come from space. And so we'll put that one here. And then we kind of, we talk a little bit about um, this rock in the sense that this rock isn't a meteorite, but it is, in a, in a way, it's kind of like a space rock because this is, is tektite. And this one went, was as a result of a meteorite impact and it melted it. It's almost glass-like on the one surface and it melted that um, I'm thinking it's like the, earth sand. sand like a sand yeah. like calcium um, uh, silicon, silicon dioxide. dioxide that's the word. Mm -hmm. Silicon dioxide and then it um, when it hit it bounced back up went into the upper atmosphere cooled off and then when it came back down, it was hardened as, as this, um, what we call tektite. And so it's, it's an earth rock, but it's not, a, and it's kind of a space rock, but it's not a meteorite. And so then we can, we can go on a little bit more if, we, if the audience is interested about what kinds that we might call these um, and we know what their compositions are. But one, with most of the time, our audiences are rather small, so we try to give them some more hands-on, this is what I can do, and less talking. And so I'll show them this one, which is a like a cutaway of, a, I believe this one's a crondite, similar yeah. to this one. It's not a, a metallic one, but it's mm. a crondite. And so then they can look at it with the, with the uh, magnifying glass and, and try to see some of the other particles that are in there besides the metallic particles. But this one is also magnetic, just not as extremely magnetic as the, as the iron was. Um, we were very fortunate to get from the Night Sky Network a collection um, as a thank you, and we've gotten these over the years, a few thank yous for um, doing the outreach that we do. And these are um, meteorites from different regions. Mm. Um, a Thailandite. It's a tektite, so it's not going to be. It's not going to be um, magnetic. This one is a uh, an iron um, coarsest octahedrite. Octahedrite. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, and so Very that one words. is metallic <laughs> or, or uh, magnetic. Here's one Campo del Cielo. And this one is a coarse octahedrite. There's several examples. These poor bags have been through the ringer. Um, and this one's this one's a tektite from Vietnam. It's of course just it's a tektite, so it's not magnetic. So we can talk a little bit more about the different types, what they might look like. Um, there used to be a show on meteorite <laughs> hunter that would make this a little bit more. Yeah. Um, now 
Uh, I, I just put up an image of a chondrite since we can't get, you know, we can't yeah, quite get a close up yeah. of some of these. Um, but this is what you would you. see with your yeah. with your view glass. Uh, yeah, I, I even if we put the rock up, we could try putting the rock close to the camera, but I have a feeling really the resolution much, yeah. won't be very good. But this is what you would. This is typically what you would see when you when you zoom in on one of these chondrites. So this is all yeah. the different particles um, that have coalesced yeah. into form the, this this particular meteorite sample. Yeah. I think this is an Arizona meteorite. So that's what you would see if we could, you know, get super high resolution with our webcam. <laughs> yeah. So I do a very um, in, kind of fun for kids activity in the, my summer camp that I run. And we um, actually make, uh, we pretend that there's different kinds of candy or brownies or Rice Krispie treats are um, meteor, meteorites. And we take slices of them and draw them and examine them and then we also talk about the different kinds of meteorites so that and they can kind of get a feel for what a what a scientist would do if they could cut apart these different rocks and so that's that's a kind of a fun activity and they learn some of the terminology and it gets get a chance to record their data so this is a kit that can you is this something that you can order from the night sky um, network not that i'm aware of okay. um, if you are a Night Sky Network member, which just requires doing two, um, two or three events a year as an astronomy club that does outreach, or it could be an after-school group, you know, like a teacher could do that as an after-school activity, and they can get these these supplies. Um, and every time, you know, you can you can keep getting more and more. We've just accumulated them or acquired them as time went on as a new kit was released because we do way more than, than that every year. We, we're up to like, what, 15, 15. 20, 15 to 20 a year. I do a five day, three hours a day summer camp. So right there I do quite a bit just in that one week. Wow. I use pretty much all of the kits during that week. And then you also send a bunch of data back to NASA, right? right. For, for right. And we have to document for how many how many mm -hmm. people you use these with mm -hmm. and in the demographics right. and that's how they that's how NASA gets their funding is under knowing what effect their um, work is having on um, on the education of of the public so right. what they do exactly. I hate to bring this up but these things might be changing <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I, I did. I did include a link just now on um, to the Night Sky Network. Um, okay, it's run great. through JPL NASA. Um, if you if you if you have a club that can get in now, <laughs> yes, these things might become even more valuable than yes. they are yeah. <laughs> already. Yeah, in the near future. So, well, thank you for our, our demo. Oh, that's a, that's going to be our hands-on demo for the week, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> And awesome. Oh, um, yeah. So do you want to go ahead and maybe go back and introduce yourselves and, and the kind of work that you do and, and the club that you represent? Right. Talk about yeah, the club and um, give the new website if you can remember what it is. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll let Jeff <laughs> take it away. Or, Jeff's, yeah, start Jeff's with the president of the, of the Astronomy Club. Yes. There we go. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah, my name is Jeff Menz. I'm uh, the president of the uh, River Bend Astronomy Club. And um, we've... Both Terry and I have been members since uh, 2004. I, I believe, believe so. Uh, the club originated in approximately 2001. Uh, there were four members that uh, got together and um, decided to incorporate as a club. And uh, uh, Gary Cronk was the uh, first president of the, of the club, and uh, he's uh, internationally known for his uh, his uh, uh, comets, uh, right. comet information. Mm -hmm. He's written, I think, he's on his fourth book now. And so he's uh, he's well versed in in, uh, in comets. Um, we're not quite that well versed. But, uh, we uh, and photographer and as a well. photographer. Yes. Yes. He's a wonderful right. astrophotographer. Yes. And we were very jealous of his roll off <laughs> roof observatory in his backyard. And I've always wanted one, but yeah. Terry gets a new kitchen Someday. first. Someday. So. No. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, the club has uh, about twenty eight to thirty members and varies in age from 17 up to retirement age and um, it's a it's a real uh, diverse group of people with lots of different uh, abilities we have a, a brand new website it's uh, www.riverbendastro.org 
Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one of our newer members, uh, Dan, Dan Brandon, had uh, uh, took the old site and basically gave it a gave it a fresh mm -hmm. look, and it, it's it's very nice. He's, Dan's he's, actually watching right now, so. <laughs> he's <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, he's, he's done a very nice job. Yeah, we're very it's happy a beautiful with it. Site. So, yeah. if you have an opportunity, go take a look at it. And yeah, you guys have you have club member images. You have local. So, when we say local, this is um, <clears throat> near Edwardsville, Illinois, which is where we're broadcasting from. You guys have local weather. You have images of the sun. You have the moon phase. You have uh, images from club members, news stories. So, you it's uh, it's a really good resource. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we hope to build on it as uh, more and more club members uh, uh, try their hand at astrophotography. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we uh, we'll put uh, uh, we have a calendar on there uh, with our different outreach events. Uh, I know we have one. Uh, our next uh, club meeting is actually April thirteenth, and that'll be at the Children's Museum in Edwardsville. Yay! And, uh, right. so, Excellent place. Uh, we mm -hmm. love the children's we, museum. We have a, a couple of events a year. Uh, Starry Starry Nights. Um, mm -hmm. I believe that's what this one is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's typically in January, and we kind of refer to it as snowy, snowy nights <laughs> sometimes because <laughs> uh, sometimes the weather doesn't cooperate. But when it's when it's clear, the skies in the winter time are just just fabulous. And even even under Edwardsville skies, um, mm -hmm. you can uh, you can you know Orion is well placed it in the in the evening sky, and mm -hmm. yeah, if we get the moon, you know, like a first quarter moon, that's always a, a nice, mm -hmm. nice, you know, a nice item to, for the people to, right. to look at. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have a we have several club members who have their own own little offshoots events. Um, um, Bill and Rita Breeden, um, they live in St. Louis, and every month. I believe it's the third Wednesday of each month. They have uh, what they call the Francis Park Stargazing, and it's at uh, Tam Avenue and Itasca Streets in St. Louis. Within walking distance yeah. of Ted Drew's. Yes. <laughs> so if you're a Ted Drew's fan, that's so a that place is right. To go. Yeah, I is that to, right downtown or to live right by there? Okay. Uh, like the yeah. St. Louis, St. Louis Hills area. Okay, yes. it's a very nice area. Yeah. And from seven to nine thirty p.m. on on the third Wednesday of each mm -hmm. month. Bill or Reed are watching right now. They can uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, but uh, they they're out there all the time as long as the skies are clear. They're doing the John Dobson thing. I was gonna say, so yeah, sidewalk astronomy. That's and right. um, do you know how many people they they would regularly get? Uh, Sometimes sure. it's pretty high, especially when the park is busy. I think. Yes. Yeah. yeah when the weather's nice and people are mm -hmm. just tickers. wandering by. Yes. 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 <clears throat> so that's that's a great example of yeah, just getting people, out where the people are. And right? I think there's regulars that have figured out that they're going to be there on a Wednesday so very cool yes so we we also oh, get a question um, referring to I guess this refers to your outreach activities but specifically the meteorite uh, Lourdes asks have any of your anyone who's or your students or anyone who's been to one of your events actually found a meteorite hmm. not that, that we're aware seen. No. Um, I think what we probably would do is we would maybe go through the steps if we could rule anything out but I think we'd probably refer them to someone here at the university <laughs> because there's out, some sure. extra tests that we, want, right. we would be able to do on see if there's some, some you know, uh, rare metals or something in there that's that's maybe going to really give them a pinpoint for sure that it is. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So you it goes through that first test that you teach them. And then, you know, once it passes that test, yes. uh, you can actually take it to a lab and get it analyzed. Yeah, I think that's a typical thing that people bring it to their local university. Um, mm -hmm. We used to get a lot of iron slag. <laughs> when oh, I'm I know. Because unfortunately, that's magnetic too. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And so what other, out I know you did a, another outreach event almost this time last year for Yuri's Night. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that was at a really interesting location. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that one was at a, near another frozen custard place. Annie, it was right on the parking lot of Annie's, <laughs> and uh, that was kind of interesting. Last year, I wasn't able to be there, but I decided to bring my students and have them show up for me, and some of my colleagues and some of our club members were there. So um, I sent students in my place, and this was actually one of the demonstrations that they did there. Um, I have so many that it's really sometimes hard to decide what I'm going to do at a particular time. Um, or which activities, and sometimes it depends on who my volunteers are and what they're comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. 
what their expertise is. I'm very fortunate because Edwards Ridgeville High School has an excellent honors astronomy uh, class. Mm -hmm. And so I get very um, educated students in terms mm -hmm. of understanding the, the different as aspects of astronomy. Um, and then I have um, a science club. And so sometimes I'll have kids in there that are just interested in science in general. And even if they haven't had astronomy yet, they're more than willing to pitch in and they, they get, they get the bug, you know, with that. Bug oh yeah. Yet, you know, that, that, that uh, natural high when you're out there talking to people and people are so excited and kids are, are being as cute as can be and learning a lot. And so the high school students really, um, they get into it, go right for it too. They, yeah. They'll say, yeah. I didn't think this was going to be that fun, but it really was. <laughs> so. Yeah. Do you have to do any big persuading to, you know, the first time? Um, Tell them, yeah, we're going to go talk to, you know, the public and yes. the kids maybe. and They don't think they know very much about it, and so they're afraid to, to talk okay. to the public about it. But then once they're out there, they realize they do know more. And, yeah. and then awesome. I, I yeah. tell them, the more you talk about it, the more you learn because you're, you're educating yourself yeah, as you go through the materials mm -hmm. and, and, you, and it gets it in, in your brain. Too, so yeah, definitely. There's nothing like having to teach it or trying to teach it to uh, mm -hmm. really, to you really know, get it in there mm -hmm. in your brain for good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, do you do any other any training with your high school students, or anything? You know, give them any advice, or yes. or do you just kind of say it'll be okay and, and get them I out there? Do tell them at these public events, especially. We don't know what audience we have. Sometimes they'll come to me, come with me to school events. And we know the target audience, but when it's a public event, you have no idea. So they, I have to explain to them that they may be talking to a two-year-old, and they may be talking to, you know, a 82-year-old. And so they have to tailor their discussion. And and some, and I, I sometimes tell them, well, sometimes that kid just wants to get their hands in the flower because we do a <laughs> moon crater activity. And I said, they, the two-year-old wants to just put their hands in the flower. That's okay. They <laughs> found out science is fun. And sometimes they just want to play with the magnets with the meteorites, and that's okay, too, because they know now that some rocks are magnetic. It's just fun. Yeah. 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 But they've had that experience, and they've seen that science can be fun, and so so it's all good. Right. They just kind of have to go with what they, what mm -hmm. they want to do. When, and they, they get surprised that they know as much as they do know. Yeah. About, about oh, that's space. wonderful. In right. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how many high school students do you have um, involved with club activities at the moment? It varies from year to year, I it suppose. Has to vary. And, it varies yeah. from year to year because I, sometimes those break my heart when they graduate because then I've lost yeah, them no. to, you know, <laughs> some big universities and they're far away. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they stay close and that's always good. Um, I do have um, some returning in the summertime that will come back and help. Um, one of our club members is actually in college right now, but whenever she's in town, she'll she'll of course come come to some of our outreach events. So mm -hmm. it's always kind of nice to have her, um, her have her back. She yeah. she oh, loves yeah. doing it. She loves oh, doing awesome. it. That's great. And she's an engineering yeah. student. So. She's yes. engineering. Oh, yes. wonderful. Yeah, she uh, started when she was really young in middle school, I think. Yes. Her father's wow. a club member, and she would come along to the club meetings and. And kind of just hang with her dad and learn. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon he got her a scope, and pretty soon dad couldn't come for a while, and here'd come Lauren, and she'd, she'd tag along with us. And even before she could drive, or it was too far for her to drive, she'd just ride with us and come on out and do outreach. So it was, it's, you know, it's a really, kids get the bug, and they, mm -hmm. they want to stick with it. So Yeah, and they're developing really good skills. Mm -hmm. They're learning how to deal with people and all kinds of people, mm -hmm. all ages, mm -hmm. and how to tailor their communication depending on who they're talking to. It's just, it's invaluable. It is. It <laughs> is. It really is. It is. Yeah. yeah. So we have a, we have a comment from Paul Harper um, saying that many local astronomical societies here in England, where he is, um, do similar such activities, such as he uh, works with the Croydon Astronomical Society. Do you find that's rather typical of astronomy clubs that they do a lot of outreach like you guys do? Or is that, you know, something special you had to get going? Probably just depends on the type of club. Um, when this, uh, when Riverbend started up, it was primarily an, an observing club, and uh, our meetings were around uh, the scopes. You know, we set up in somebody's backyard, and mm -hmm. you know, we, we might talk 
you know, business for five minutes or something, and then we spent the rest of the night looking through the scopes. And I'm not sure exactly when we got started with Night Sky Network, but Terry fell right into it. So mm -hmm. She uh, she's a second career teacher, so she uh, she got the the uh, teaching bug, if you will. And um, this is just an offshoot of of mm -hmm. her her second career. Mm -hmm. So. Um, an early member, Mark Brown, was actually the person who first made contact with the Night Sky Network, and he got us started with our first couple of, of kits, and he's just been doing, you know, he's even, he's had to move, but he did so much at first with um, starting our outreach, um, you know, really getting it going and finding sources for um, freebies, handouts, things mm -hmm. that loves yeah. those <laughs> and so he would find um, resources for that and then what he would do is um, try to try to convince club members to, to come and and he got our interest right away um, he, they um, even through that they were able to get um, was an early picture uh, from um, Hubble the uh, <clears throat> humble image that right. hangs now in the children's museum and it was because of that work that, that he did, that early work that he did, that they were able to acquire that image. So yeah. that was pretty neat. Yeah, Mark was employed at the St. Louis Science Center for a number mm -hmm. of years. And so he has some yes. contacts. And uh, we had mm -hmm. some, uh, we actually had some unveilings of uh, Hubble photos. Wow. Um, you know, the day that, mm. you know, the uh, NASA was trying to get uh, public interest in it. And so they'd have a big public unveiling of a, of a you know, large high resolution photo I think m51 was one of them mm -hmm. and um, you know mm -hmm. we were able to do those those unveilings at the children's museum in Edwardsville mm -hmm. wonderful and that was oh, all through, through Mark's uh, coordination mm -hmm. oh, nice. yeah nice. so and um, with him and another early member Mike Leith just being they're, they're just some regulars that have just been wonderful um, in in supporting the outreach and trying to be there so that we have not, not only a variety of telescopes, but a variety, variety of perspectives on, on astronomy. Um, um, Mike represent, is a good representative of what you can do once you're retired <laughs> or once your kids have grown. And even if you have that interest when you're younger and you're too busy with the softball games and the hockey <laughs> and the running into karate and, and doing all those other yeah. things, <laughs> you can... Um, look forward to that later on but you can <laughs> right. still mm -hmm. do astronomy so there's that audience and there, and he's just got this wonderful patience with children and so he's very good about explaining um what is being seen through the telescope how the telescope works so he, he does a really wonderful job so we enjoy having him help us and we have again we have um there's a 17 year old uh, member who um convinced his father to be part of the club too and his father's gotten that interest as well and so they represent you know what fathers and sons can do um, that you don't have to be um, grown and working to to enjoy this this hobby you can do this you know early on you know if you've got a telescope or a pair of binoculars you can you can enjoy astronomy so, right. yeah, so it's nice to have a good cross cross section That's of great. members yeah. Do you find you get most of your members through word of mouth like that, through through other contacts? I'd say it's a uh, it's a mixed bag, really. Mm -hmm. We've had um, just people um, locate us online mm -hmm. and send in an application for membership. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had individuals who we've met at outreach events who uh, said, you know, this this yeah. looks like a lot of fun. You know, where you know you have contact information, and we always carry, you know, business card type things with us with contact information. And um, we have, you know, children from from the high school, you know, mm -hmm. Donnie and Caroline, mm -hmm. our daughter, uh, they've, uh, they've been interested in it since they were really little. Mm -hmm. Donnie especially, mm -hmm. he just fell into that. Yeah. Um, we found them um, through an article that, that Gary Cronk had written, it was in our local paper. And when we read it, we thought, there's an astronomy club local. We didn't know that. We just mm -hmm. thought the nearest one was over in St. Louis. And so um, I think you followed through to find out where, mm -hmm. where they were at and, and how we could get in touch with them. And, right. and that's how we got involved. 
Um, Dan, if he's still online, Dan apparently found us through Night Sky Network. Is that right? I think that's oh, correct. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And then we've had other people contact us through the Night Sky Network. The only caveat to that is, is sometimes they think we're in Chicago. <laughs> so because you know. Just island park. Yeah, and, and, island, and then so. then when they realize how far away oh, they are from us, we make sure all. they understand <laughs> that coming to meetings might be a bit of a challenge. And then they're like, "Well, maybe <laughs> we'll just have to, you know, look at your astrophotography online." <laughs> so, yeah. do you have any people that contact you for help with telescopes um, yes. advice? And because mm -hmm. that's something I'd always heard, um, and I think it's good advice. You know, you ask somebody who does a lot of work with. Mm -hmm. um, telescopes that are a little more manageable and smaller than the professional, the big professional things. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, do you get yeah, what kind yeah. of requests well, and yeah. we, we get a variety questions? of requests. Uh, some of them are you know, uh, questions about go to. Some of them are you know like aligning you know, the mirrors on a dob, okay. Dobsonian scopes. And what we'll usually do is we'll put them in contact with someone in the club who has that type of scope. Mm -hmm. You know, we yeah. we have. Uh, there's quite a variety of uh, scopes out there, you know, big, small, yes. you know, schmick acid rings, daubs, um, you know, refractors, you know, just, I mean, if you can name a type of scope, I think we probably have one. Probably, right. And how about uh, people looking to buy one? Um, yes. I don't know, Christmas presents and all that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you get that kind of question too. Mm -hmm. we, we get a lot Are you of, brave enough to recommend? We, we get a, a lot <laughs> a of telescope. Orion uh, telescope and binocular catalogs, and we keep them all, <laughs> and we take them with us to outreach events. And when oh, people right. ask, it's like, well, take a look at this. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it gives you a variety. You know, mm -hmm. you can spend a hundred dollars, which I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> or you can spend several thousand dollars, which I wouldn't recommend. <clears throat> you know, find something in the middle, something that's you know, one you can you can <coughs> trans you can transport as necessary. Um, you know, and it's going to do what you want. You know, if you want to do astrophotography, you want to get an astrophotography. You don't necessarily want to dob because you know you're not mm. gonna photos you're trying to push that around. You need something that tracks. Yeah. That's good. It's good to talk to somebody who knows and has had some experience mm -hmm. using it. And then, of course, going to an outreach event or a star party is a great way to actually cruise the line of telescopes exactly. and see oh, yes. there and what right. it is, So, right. which is a whole lot of fun. And, um, and I know probably at most of your events you have both an outreach area um, and the telescopes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I usually try to be right. indoors, but if there's a pavilion like in a park, it's lighted, um, then I'll set up there and to do the do the activities and then, then we'll have a darker area that we do the scopes. We do one at uh, Silver Lake Park in Highland where um, it's a night it's a night hike and so the kid, the kids and the adults will go on their hike and when they come out of their hike it is pretty dark and I will be set up under street light and then Jeff and the other club members will be in a darker area that's surrounded by pine trees. So they they'll see me, and I'll say, "Okay, go look through the scopes," you know. Now and then, on your way back, come see me, and we'll we'll do some activities. And then I've got some handouts, and that way they're not losing the handouts in the dark. <laughs> that's a good idea. I figured that out over the years. So we find them <laughs> the next day in the grass. All over the place. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I, we were going to talk maybe about some challenges and, and benefits of, of doing outreach. Um, so I don't know if one of you would like to take one of those uh, topics and, Why don't and you take start the out. Why um, the challenge? Do you okay. want to do the, the, the good stuff first? Or the <laughs> okay. Oh. You can do the hard stuff first. Too. Yeah. yeah, the hard stuff first. Okay. Well, one of the challenges is, of course, having enough people to help. That's, mm -hmm. that's one of my biggest challenges. And, and it's only because I sometimes I don't know how many people are going to be there, and I'm a little worried sometimes right up to the to the to the moment yeah. as to whether or not we're going to have enough scopes for the enough people. But it usually works out that either the person who asked us to come overestimated, or <laughs> the or the number of club members that didn't RSVP. You know, they, they decide to come after all. Anyway, and yeah. so it, it almost always has worked out. I think there's only been a few times when we've been overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, then one of the challenges with just having the right people and the right number of people is that school events are on school nights usually. 
and school nights are work nights. Mm -hmm. And they very rarely do them on Fridays at schools, so that makes it hard because if they did, at least that person, that club member, wouldn't have to be driving a fair distance to go home and sleep to get up the next day for work. But, but anyway, on mm -hmm. week, weeknights that are not Fridays, it is tough because not only do they have to get off work and get there in time because they usually yeah. start early, to, then they have to and set up and then get started at the time and then take down and then drive home. It, they, the, it, the, the schools don't always realize the challenges because we're not like um, in a bigger city, there might be the denser population of the schools and the astronomers to do this, but mm -hmm. we're, we're in the Midwest where there's a little less um, dense a little population. Sparse sometimes, yes, right? yes, and we're <laughs> spread farther. We have members, like I said, from St. Louis all the way to, um, we've got some in O'Fallon. We've got someone who's Bavo. in Salem, Salem yes. Illinois. Yeah, for a while. He, he would drive up on a, occasional weekend to visit mom and come come to the meeting but that kind of strong difficult yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah um but and we've got some in troy um we've got the oh. dan's in um Bethalto. in Bethalto. lots of places separated by cornfields as far as i can tell i'm still a relatively new transplant here, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah so yeah. It, that's the challenge this is the 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 number of people and then um, for student events, then it matters what's on the school calendar for us, mm. so whether there's a conflict there, um, that could be a challenge, um, whether they can make it to that site, and I don't ask them to go real distant sites. Um, if we're doing something, we did one in Lebanon, for instance, and that's a little bit far, I think, for Edwardsville kids to drive, so I didn't ask them to come to that one. Mm -hmm. um, so that one was one, it fortunately was handled by some pre-service teachers. They were mainly doing all the activities and I was just bringing activities for them to do. So that one, that was good. They were had a ready-made uh, volunteer, uh, volunteer pool. Um, but when, um, when we do events that are, that are close, like Annie's, like the Children's Museum, right like, in town, yeah. yeah, right in mm -hmm. town, some of the schools in town, that's just wonderful. Um, when we're in Highland, I try to get Highland kids because I, you know, we have a daughter in high school. She has friends that like science, so that that's always always nice. So that that's a challenge to find them, but I can usually round them up. I like that your challenge was worrying that you'd get too many people at your event, not not enough people. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had that too. Been been disappointed and have had more volunteers than I've had people, and that and again sometimes. I, like we've had that happen at the Children's Museum because it's been bad weather, mm. but it's on their calendar and we're there. Um, where or um, it's been a busy time, like it was soccer season. We had an astronomy day. We were out in the backyard of the Children's Museum. We we're going to do um, just some what what you can see in the daytime. I think the moon might have been visible that right. day. But we I had a whole bunch of kids lined up. It's so many activities, and I think we had more volunteers than we had oh. kids come through. <laughs> yeah. It was just one of those days where there was soccer or yeah, something else going on. Right. Yeah. yeah, and you know, even the, the the organizers don't always know what those yeah. challenges are. Yeah. So, yeah. what about some of the benefits then? Yeah, so benefits. we'll hear some good stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> benefits. Oh gosh, where do you start? <laughs> um, and if I if I get choked up, it's from uh, my own childhood experiences. Oh, you know, uh, okay. When That's I, uh, all right. <laughs> when I uh, uh, I was seven uh, at the time of Apollo 11, mm -hmm. and so I grew up in the, the space age, and uh, yeah. yeah, just like everybody else, wanted to be an astronaut. Um, of course, realized that wasn't realistic, but <laughs> still enjoyed space, and uh, um, you know, my parents realized that and so they got me a small department store telescope and a little two inch refractor and and it was it was okay <laughs> but I didn't I didn't have <clears throat> excuse me I didn't have the opportunity to see these sizable scopes that are available to amateurs now mm. and that sort of thing would have just been wonderful yeah. and yeah <clears throat> and so uh, 
I like having the opportunity to share that with the kids. Mm -hmm. Right. The kids are just so enthusiastic. And I, it's, it's fun when you have one that is just so fascinated. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember there was one event that it was, it was, it almost, I, I could still remember it because we were at the Children's Museum. It was a, a Star Star Night. It was in January. And I was doing an activity that was fairly new called the Pocket Solar System. And so I wasn't real sure. Yeah, you know about that one. And, um, and Nicole's dancing. Um, <laughs> it's so easy. You just bring receipt tape and stickers and you're good. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, this was before the sticker idea came along. Oh, okay. And so we were writing things out. And so yeah. I was trying to say, now, if you can't spell Neptune or you can't spell Uranus, <laughs> just put the, bit, the capital letter and that's okay. You know, or have your mom or dad help you. And so here's this little girl. I know she wasn't hardly even in kindergarten. And so I'm holding it up, and she's insisting on writing the whole word. <laughs> and I'm holding up my tape, and I'm trying to show her how to spell it and spell it out for her. And she's just writing it out. And, I'm, and I turned to her. It was her grandmother with her, and I said, how does she know this? Mm. And her, I can't remember the name of the astronaut, but who's the astronaut from Belleville? There's an astronaut oh, from Belleville, and that was her I cousin. I should know that, and I don't. Oh. Really? Her cousin. Cousin. Oh, she goes, and, and I'm talking about life. Uh, the other activity I was doing was how we find planets around other stars, and wouldn't that be cool if we went to another planet? And she goes, well, my cousin's going to go to the moon. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> 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 and I was like, hmm. Uh -huh. and, and so she was talking about That's her amazing. cousin. Sandra Magnus? Is that oh, That's okay. her. She's yeah. the astronaut from Belleville. <laughs> That was her. That was her cousin, and it it would just crack me up. I still rem I still remember her. She just was so knowledgeable. She wasn't even in kindergarten yet. She was just just smart as a whip. Knew all that's the planets. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So, Good. but that's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. And I know sometimes there'll be an experience where I'll have a student inside or a child inside who's just so knowledgeable, and I'll after the event because we don't get to talk to each other during the event. And after the event, I'll say, Hey, Jeff. Do you remember this one? Did you have this one kid come to your scope and and it's then? Like, oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> usually it's yes. just one kid makes the whole event worthwhile. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. They are just that they make it worth it because they just eat it up. They appreciate it. They ask a zillion questions. Good and questions. Good questions. Mm -hmm. Not yes. annoying questions, but good. Questions. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. So. Yeah, and it can make such a big difference. Um, we talk about this a lot, just with all kinds of, of science, career, thinking of careers. And, you know, sometimes it's just um, providing an opportunity to make a child aware of what is out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that can make all the difference. And, like, you were talking about your childhood. You know, I think that way sometimes, too. You know, gosh, mm -hmm. if I'd only known that, you know, mm -hmm. this type of career path was out there or I could do this and... Right. And you never know when that opportunity is going to come for a child, mm -hmm. and it right. can be spectacular. So, and and I would just say, you know, amateur astronomers and astronomy clubs, I think, just they have this reputation of, um, of course, loving what they do, and mm -hmm. they're doing it because they love it, not because uh -huh. they're being paid. Um, and you know that kind of shines through, and um, and people know that, and. So people rely on them really to to share that love of the universe um, with other people, with the public. They're the ones out there all the time, with people at Annie's, you know, having ice cream mm -hmm. and custard and mm -hmm. looking at the moon, and yeah. it's it's wonderful. So it's it's just a fabulous experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah, people really, um, like I say, get the bug. Yeah. You try it, and it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Like you said, um, yeah. the astronomy club is a good place to look at telescopes if you're thinking to find one too. It's just because, you know, right. I in my experience, people in astronomy clubs have been just always willing to show off their equipment, show you through what's what you can see through the eyepiece, talk about it, help you. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I wish I had hooked up with an astronomy club when I was a kid because I was so clueless <laughs> with my little department star <laughs> telescope. You know, just like you yeah. said. Well, and then of course we help each other. You know, mm -hmm. when somebody's having trouble with something or somebody wants an opinion on a particular eyepiece, should they buy this or that, then they could actually take it for a test drive 
on, on their scope. You know, just can I borrow your nice your yeah. dry piece and see what <laughs> it looks like through my scope, and you right. know, then decide whether that's what they want to buy. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember the one boy? He was a, a grad student actually at was it Greenville, and um, and he came to the club and basically he was building a dog. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and about several club members. I think Jamie was pretty instrumental in helping him. Jamie Goggin, who's another early member of our club, mm -hmm. and he um, helped him get that going and, and gave him lots of advice. Mm -hmm. And so we still kind of keep in touch with him once in yeah. a while, Facebook and. Yeah, I I don't think there are that many club members who've actually built their own equipment. Okay, I was I wondering think, about that. I think I think Gary built it. one, but. Yeah. yeah, I think when we say build one. Does that mean grinding the mirror? Grind that, the mirror and that's you know, put it all together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us like, well, let's see, what can I afford? Uh, yeah. You know, what do I want? Right. What do I need? And I don't know. I used to hear about. I mean, dogs are much more available and cheaper, really, than yeah. I don't know. Twenty years ago, when I first got into astronomy, astronomy clubs, and I knew lots of people who were grinding mirrors <clears> and building their own dobs because that was the kind of scope to build and. And um, you could get, you know, a lot of bang for your buck um, just by building one. But now I think, um, you know, if I were going to buy one, I'd, I'd be looking at a Dobbs just to buy mm -hmm. because they're so much more available. Mm -hmm. so, oh, yes. They're, they're great. great. They're great fairly stuff. easy to use, too, so that yeah. makes it kind of nice. It's yeah. a light bucket. It's just a light bucket. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I know. They're huge. One of our <laughs> outreaches, we were at Greenville um, Middle School. Um, this past winter, actually, yes. and, and we did a, a, a an outreach. It was with some other people too. Some the one of the couple of the teachers from the school. They did the, like the star hopping, and um, I think one of them had a scope, and they showed the moon. <coughs> Excuse me, the moon. But um, we had we have two. We have a Schmidt Casgrain and, and a Dob, and they're both ten they're both ten, ten inch inches. Scopes. And mm -hmm. so Jeff was running the Schmidt Casgrain. And I and he helped me get the job set up because I'm more the hands-on activity person, not the telescope person, but I can move it around if I need to. And so we each were tandem right next to each other. And so we'd have these kids look through each one, and then then Jeff had a whole description of, yeah. of how to compare the images. And yeah, we had we had the same size eyepiece uh, on each scope, and mm. both mm. ten-inch scopes. Okay. Um, Thing is that the uh, focal length on the Schmidt cast grain is 2,500 millimeters, and for the 10 inch daub was about half that, it's about 1,200. And the same size eyepiece, you know, you're going to get a difference in magnification um, because magnification is focal length divided by the, uh, the size of the eyepiece in millimeters of the eyepiece. So for the same size eyepiece, your magnification will be twice as much with the Schmidt cast grain. Just because it's a longer focal mm -hmm. length, and so you know, challenging the kids, it's like, okay, you, you have a ten-inch scope, you know, two ten-inch scopes, <laughs> same size eyepiece. Why does one show the image so much larger than the other? And they're like, oh, oh. so, so well, it's brilliant. You're teaching optics, hands <laughs> on. I love it. <laughs> and so we start t showing, you know, okay, you know, what happens to the light when it comes into the instrument, and so. You know, you show for the daub, and then you show for the Schmidt cast grain. The Schmidt cast grain, you know, bounces around several times, and so you know it, it's actually longer than what the daub's is. Right. Can you see a difference in brightness um, um, as well, or is that a little harder? To... It's a little bit harder. Well, we were looking at the Orion Nebula, so it's <laughs> kind of a kind of an amorphous thing anyway. Mm, okay. You're still collecting the same amount. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah, big ten inch eyeball. Yeah. <laughs> um, Terry, I wanted to ask you for our viewers about your shirt, if you could describe what's going on. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> well, this was actually this is from Cafe Press and it's just uh, the, the different um, planets to scale. Yeah. So um, we do an activity with that too. I have a, a thing from Night Sky Network a <laughs> model and we talk about, you know, how many um, Earth it takes to go across Jupiter and how many Jupiters go across the Sun but um, we try to talk about um, different aspects of our solar system not only the difference in the size but the difference in the position mm -hmm. of the planets around the Sun mm -hmm. and there's websites you can go to to find on any given day where they are and so we have a activity we can plot those um, and then we also talk about um, 
the the, the uh, pocket solar system. So the distances from each other that they are. And so there's all these different aspects of the solar system that we cover. So I have this shirt. I have um, a, a black hole shirt. Well, a shirt that shows the, the, the life cycle of a star. Mm. It's got black holes and supernovas on it. And I have a black hole kit, a supernova kit. So we, we do those activities. I'll wear that shirt usually. <laughs> cool. So oh, nice. um, then I've got a telescope shirt. I wore that the other night. We did an activity with um, the... Um, it was a kindergarten reading night. reading night, mm -hmm. and now and they asked me to do a telescope activity. I thought, oh my, <laughs> because that's a you know teaching optics to middle school <laughs> is one thing, but teaching optics to kindergartners is a little different. So I thought, well, we'll just do the basic why is it upside down activity, and so we have a and I meant to bring that, but I didn't get to get a chance to grab it. But it's a some foam and some sticks, and it kind of works kind of like showing the how the image gets yeah it's kind of like if you looked in a spoon yeah. and it and it and it makes you look upside down and we talk about how the the image gets inverted and how the light rays that were at the, your forehead and you're looking at a flat mirror have now been curved down and now they're going down to where your chin is and vice versa mm -hmm. and so we talk about that a little bit and I've got a couple of demos. One of them is a um, uh, so three laser lights. Then I shine them on the wall and through a very large lens, very d d definitely um, convex lens mm -hmm. that could, and we've just told them that it's a curved lens. Mm -hmm. and, and then so they have to guess which of those three laser lights is going to go out if we cover, let's say, the one on the right. Which light on the wall is going to go out? after it's gone through this lens and it's you know and they have to figure this out and so they explain well why did the other one go the one on the left go out when we covered up the right and so on and that that activity kind of drives home that well it's flipped the image around and we use the sticks and foam to kind of show that and the the sticks are just barbecue skewers and when they cross mm -hmm. each other it shows that where the focal point is and then um I have another one that's a tabletop telescope. So I've got two lenses, and then I've got this um, neon light. It's a rose, so it's got red on top and green on the bottom. And it's a light, so they can know what they're looking for. And so they'll look through their telescope that's open on the desktop or on the tabletop, and they'll look through it and say, oh, it's upside down. And so when we can, and then I'll ask them, well, you saw that over there. Why? Can you tell me why mm -hmm. this is upside down? And so they'll look at the lenses and they'll see they're curved and they'll say, well, it's because the lenses are curved. So <laughs> even with kindergartners, we managed to get the point across. So that's so great. Pretty that's good. fun to put something yeah. like that together, right? Yeah. With the challenge of bringing it to, you know, a, a younger person's mm -hmm. level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, and it, still it, making it interesting and yeah. engaging. And fun. Yeah. yeah. And then so, they get to look perfect. through telescopes. So Yay. So I have a hands-on <laughs> cheapo toy one that yeah. they can just look through, and then and then they can go out and look through the one outside. Through the good and, ones. Yeah. yeah. So they kind of it's, it's so cute. They were, yeah. they were. You tell them. Well, it's easier if you close one eye. So they close that eye, and then they look. Let's <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. With one eye, close. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. Or they'll do that, but you know they'll they'll try to. Try to like sneak, sneak up, up on, on the eye you know, <laughs> like they couldn't see. Yeah. So it was so cute watching them. But yeah. I was trying yeah. to give them practice before they went outside and stood in the, <laughs> the big one. But oh well, really so, ready. Yeah. So we're wrapping up on an hour. Uh, I wanted to remind everyone watching that if you want to find out more about Riverbend Astronomy Club, you go to riverbendastro.org. I'll put that link um, in the show notes on YouTube. Uh, and your webmaster, Dan, uh, wanted to add as well that you can request, if you're local to, to our area, you can request your outreach, ser outreach services via an online form. So you can get, you can get uh, Jeff and, and, and Terry and anybody else from the club to, to come speak. Um, and you also have, I think you're working on a public forum as well, and the website's free to register uh, if you want to, to join in as well. And... Um, I think that's they're yes. on Google Plus too. I know that. Oh yes, you're on Google Plus as well. Yes, welcome, <laughs> welcome to and on Facebook and Facebook, oh, Facebook everywhere. and Google Plus. 
Um, yeah, so that's uh, that is that. So I'll include those links as well. Um, do you have any parting thoughts you'd like to leave about? Real quick, I know you brought a bunch of interesting stuff. Any real <clears throat> quick thing you want to exit um, this with? No, other than just <laughs> letting that you know that sometimes we have at our outreach events, if you come, freebies. We get postcards, posters. I've gotten some really cool things like uh, rulers with neat um, images on one side. Sometimes we on glasses. We got solar glasses actually for the Venus transit. That was fun. Those are these are digging. Yes. Oh, she's <laughs> looking for. I have a pair. I don't know where it is. I think. Yes, and when the, when I give students these in our high school, then we look at the the, the different uh, different ah, uh, glasses. Yeah, there's okay, her right, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. The darn thing. Yeah, glasses on. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's the we talk a, a lot of. We have another activity that we do about sorting the solar system and sorting it by um, what image it was taken with, so infrared, ultraviolet, so on. So that's where these things come in handy, having different ways of looking at images in space. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Explaining awesome. why we have different kinds of telescopes. Oh, look at him. Oh, gosh. What's this? Here Chris. This is Captain Chuck. Captain Chuck. Required to, to Chuck. include. Okay. <laughs> Do it for you, viewers. <laughs> yes, and I'm replenishing my supply of freebies as we speak. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all the great educational NASA products that are now endangered. Yeah. Hint, hint. Yeah. Write your Congress, maybe. Complain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. Oh, very. Yeah. But yeah, this is um, all really excellent. Sorry for my. <laughs> A little frustrated. I know. Uh, no. But you guys are doing excellent, excellent work. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'd encourage anyone to get in contact with you guys if they're looking to start this in their own community and, and get some advice because you guys are doing amazing stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So. Riverbendastro.org, right? And yes. right. Jeff and Terry Men. So thank you guys so much for being here. Okay. Thank you. Lots of fun. Thanks for having us. Yes, we enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. Um, right. Our next Hangout is tomorrow at noon Pacific. Planetary Society hosts their Hangout. Uh, then Friday, we have the Weekly Space Hangout, where we round up all of our news. Um, and then on Sunday, we have the Virtual Star Party. So no matter where you are or what your weather is like, we have telescope views for you guys to see here on Google+. Um, and a quick plug for anyone local watching, I, I'm, I'm temporarily taking over the SIUE star parties on Tuesday, every other Tuesday night. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned for information about that. <laughs> wow. uh, I have, uh, I'll have i be doing that for the first time. So, yay, real life yay. star party again. <laughs> All so, right. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, is this the one at, at, here at SIU? Yes, yes, well, that Tom Foster yes. usually does. Yes. It, okay. he's, his foot's still in a boot, so <laughs> <laughs> you're going to do it. Till he recovers. So you'll get to see some of the students from uh, Bridgeville High School, maybe? Uh, yep, yeah. that's right. And Dave Bodeker, yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, very excited. Real life star parties again. All right, thank you so much for joining us, everybody, and have a good week. All right. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.